the first thing you have to do after you wedge the clay and make sure that it doesn't have any air in it is to center it on the wheel. If you don't center that clay, you're not going to be able to do very much with it. So you have to center it so that it stops wobbling and it is perfectly still going around in a fast uh, world that, that is perfectly centered and perfectly still. That in itself is just internally calming and in order when you feel that clay stop wobbling and get centered. Wow, that the first time that happened that, that I accomplished it, it was amazing. I was, uh, I took piano lessons from a, a, a young child because my father believed that you were not truly a whole person and full citizen unless you understood and engaged in the arts. Uh, he played the violin, so my sister did as well. My mother played piano, and so we took piano lessons. And long story short, uh, I, I took a flute as my primary instrument when I got into elementary school and had some real champions um, for my flute playing in my elementary school. <clears throat> One of my teachers heard me play piano, actually, uh, and decided that I was good enough to go to this national competition in New York. Now, I'm, I, I grew up in a very small little town. <laughs> the piano teacher lived in, in the next block, um, very working class neighborhood. And you don't even hear of these kinds of things. And so uh, he was introducing me to a larger world. And so we went to this New York competition called the Usted Usteadfed, I think. And uh, I thought I had rehearsed my, my church choir director, rehearsed me on this song that everybody in the competition had to play, some classical piece. And so I rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed and went up to New York with my uh, teacher uh, from elementary school or junior high, seventh grade maybe, and we landed in this huge auditorium with all of these people from all over the place. And one by one, they were called up to the stage by the panel of judges to play this song. And when I heard the first couple of people play the song, I said to myself, oh my gosh, I must have rehearsed the wrong song. They were playing it at such a rapid pace that I didn't even recognize it. Um, and so it dawned on me, oh my goodness, I rehearsed it all wrong. I'll never be able to play the notes that quickly, blah, blah, blah. And so, you, you know, I kind of said that to my teacher and he said, no, you'll do fine. So when they called my name, I of course went up and, um, and played the song as fast as I could, uh, got in all the notes, maybe missed, missed a couple, but, you know, I said, and he said, ah, you may not win, but this was really an important step and you got up there and you played it. Uh, with my flute, I was an all city band, an all city orchestra. I was good enough to make all Philadelphia junior high band and uh, then all city uh, or orchestra. But I had somewhat the same kinds of experiences um, with uh, All City Elementary Band, rather, and All City Junior High Band. I was maybe sitting uh, maybe 12th or 15th chair in the flute section, and maybe there are only 15 flutists, flautists. And, and so I was toward the, the back. And there was this passage that he was disgusted that none of the flutes were playing. Uh, I think it was the prelude to act three of La Traviata or something. And, so one by one, he said, okay, I've got to hear who can play this. And so one by one, he pointed to us and we had to play it. And, um, and the first chair played it. Then the second chair couldn't play it. On down the line till it got to me. I had taken this piece of music to my, my flute teacher, my private teacher, and uh, he taught me how to do it with a different fingering. 
And so when it got to me, I played it. And Mr. Giamo, the band leader, was absolutely stunned that an 11th chair flautist, somebody that he had placed an 11th chair, could play this passage that nobody else could. So he said, everybody move down, Vivian, move up to second chair. That was the scariest thing that, that could happen because then the first chair and I would have to play all the solos and duet parts of all of these pieces. But those kinds of experiences through the arts, I can't tell you what that began to do. For me, I was painfully shy. You might not ever think that. Painfully shy, afraid to raise my hand in class, afraid to ask questions. Uh, I, I rarely talk. You have no idea what that kind of experience does for a young person. In terms of beginning, not, not only self-confidence, but agency. And agency is related to hope. Agency gives you the sense that no matter what the challenge, you can find a way. Uh, you can, you have the sense that you can be okay, find a solution, do something, bring something out of a basic. So I didn't know that term. I only know that term, you know, late, late in my professional life, of course. Um, but I can look back and see that that's what was occurring. And hope is simply the expectation that something good will happen in the future. And hope is fed by uh, finding workable routes to your goal uh, and being able to plan and problem solve. And so there, uh, there are about eight or nine elements of hope. Uh, those experience contain a lot of those elements of hope mm -hmm. and agency. Those two things are, are, are related. So that's the beginning of my art making experience that was so powerful. Uh, and I won't go into other experiences, but in, in All City Elementary, uh, it, it, it helped with the issues of race that were bubbling up. Of course, this was in the 60s, uh, right before the, the huge civil rights movements took off. And so the arts helped in terms of my own sense of being competent. Uh, and no matter what anybody else tried to tell me or to demonstrate by excluding me from academic things that I should have been included in because of my uh, my grades, which were, were excellent. Um, the art making and the participation in art, and in this case, music, let me know that uh, I was competent to do something and that I had some gifts. So um, I think that was the beginning of, of of where my optimistic point of view started mm. and where the sense of agency began and has continued and really has been uh, confirmed and affirmed by the kind of art making um, that I do now, particularly in pottery, which is a huge hill to climb and a huge challenge. So I'll stop talking. <laughs> No, that's so that's so many things that I want to like touch on as you're talking, especially and I want to get into that pottery piece because I, okay. I want to start taking some pottery classes. There's a spot here called Cre Scarab Creative Arts where you can become oh. a member and they have, you know, the wheel and you can really like take classes and learn and um, yeah. I've really done it a few times. But it's one of those things when you were talking about, I don't know if I want to go there just yet. Let me yeah. go I'm gonna jump back and then I'm gonna come back to there. Okay. I want to talk more like really briefly about hope and another uh, to just kind of mm -hmm. add to the conversation and then go back to pottery. But uh, one of the quotes that I used in a recent article that I wrote was creativity is the great combatant to nihilism within the black plate and the black struggle. Mm -hmm. And so as I was thinking, I was kind of exploring this term nihilism and looking at like, what is hopelessness within our people? And what is it? Why does it exist? And how can we use creativity to 
to combat that and to bring, you know, hope to people that have been stripped of so many things. Um, mm -hmm. So as I think about, in particular, African-Americans, I think about that the diaspora, mm -hmm. I think about that. And I think that you're, um, you're definitely right there when you talk about creativity being something, when you can take something from nothing and turn it into something beautiful, I think that that continues to give you hope. It gives you agency. Um, mm -hmm. it, it does help you to, and as a child where you're creating music or you're maybe not, you're um, performing music and you're figuring out ways to do something difficult, then you're getting create, you're practicing um, your creativity in a way that comes to like problem solving. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, recently I was reading an article about, cause I've worked with the math and science teachers initiative here in, in at Fresno state. And we talk a lot about math and science and I'm always like the one in the room where they look at me and say, well, what do you think? And I'm like, I'm an artist, <laughs> this is very interesting. But they're constantly asking me for creative responses to very like analytical problems. Um, but I was reading an article about California just put out a thing that they're really pushing steam to make sure arts is included in science and math. Arts helps with, helps with problem solving. And so they want to make sure that the arts is included with all math and science. So I think it's interesting because when I first met you and throughout grad school, I saw you as an artist, of course, as a musician, of course, but a very like mathematic scientific mind, it seemed mm. to me at least. That's the way I like my the way I framed in my mind and as I look back of like, what did I think of Dr. V at that time? Definitely very like you use the term like I think you said kind of intelligent or something like that, like highly intelligent, but <laughs> Um, I think of that, how you've used creativity to, cause you do, uh, you were doing art therapy, right? Or music mm -hmm. therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm a Have music your, therapist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're a music therapist. Well, uh, it, it's funny that you saw me as kind of a mathematical person because I was a math major in, in, in undergrad. Makes sense. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and math and music are are connected in, in, in a lot of ways, but uh, brain-wise, uh, because art making um, uh, changes lots of things about our brain. And if we, if we engage in art making early enough, um, it uh, creates synapses uh, and brain pathways that are etched, you know, that, that are not um, etched in, in children that don't engage in art making. Um, uh, so we know that art making uh, makes positive changes in brain structure and brain chemistry. And some of that um, brain work uh, also enhances uh, a young person's ability to do math and languages. So we know that certain subjects uh, reinforce the same kinds of brain pathways. And so um, music and math and uh, language uh, are often enhanced by one another. Um, so uh, I just wanted to uh, make a comment about your, your thought that ah, she seems like a math person, um, yeah. Uh, in, in many ways, I, I've always thought that those two uh, went together. Uh, and then now there's the neurological research that uh, reinforces that. Uh, art making is the opposite of helplessness. Mm. I think you were talking about that uh, with, with, within the African-American community by virtue of the fact that it, it art making involves activity and voice and and decision making and those kinds of actions which are also elements of hope are the opposite of helplessness and so when you are engaging in art making you are beginning even though you might not be aware of it beginning to exercise the power of your voice 
and acting, uh, action rather than passive. And so it does in very many ways help uh, empower those who feel um, unseen and unempowered. It's why almost every kind of protest involves these murals uh, outside and, and, and people holding up signs and uh, making drawings and all kinds of things and singing. Everybody naturally knows that the nonverbal pieces of us can convey our emotions and feelings and thoughts a lot better than sometimes a speech would. So that's why, you know, with um, George Floyd, all these beautiful pieces of murals and uh, these murals and pieces of artwork just started emerging. But every protest of, of uh, any means will involve art making. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's symbolic power is so strong. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's definitely a reminder um, as we go about life of the necessity for the arts. I was recently finishing a um, recently finished working with it was three young ladies that, and I haven't publicly talked about it because it was you know when you go into uh, homes for women that are typically have gone through abuse yeah. with their husbands or partners. And I worked with the children there and it's one center called Marjorie Mason. And so I was working with the youth and we were doing art for the past three months weekly mm -hmm. doing art. And I just saw them like slowly begin to like become more free in their expression and mm -hmm. become more confident. And I was, you could like literally see them stepping out of a place of like hopelessness to hope. And so that is such a reminder, like the necessity for for the arts, um, especially when you're going through really challenging circumstances that are outside of your control. And yeah. uh, recently I was watching, was it Oprah and um, Michelle Obama speaking, it's a new, new Netflix discussion. And they were talking about that thing of like, when you create, like you have that power, but you have to look at, you know, Michelle Obama's talking about knitting and she's like, life can get so big and she's like I could she was just focusing on knitting she and she yeah. used that as a metaphor of like take care of what you can take care of so yeah. like whatever it is like knit do what works for you and take care of that thing and I think about that especially like as I was going through this more recent transition and life and attack and I'm like I can only take care of certain things mm -hmm. and I'm going to knit what's right here in my lap right now and it gives you this control that, okay, I can handle whatever it is in front of me because I'm not looking too far ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not getting overwhelmed. I can control this. I can do this, you know, practice of like, this is what's in my hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, you said a great word, control. Uh, it can be great. It can be a, a nuisance <laughs> sometimes, but um, that's one of the reasons uh, I, I know you, you, one of the questions you said you might explore is why I do art. And mm -hmm. I said, oh, why question? They're so difficult to answer. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, why does somebody, behavior is so multi-determined, you know, there are 10 reasons why. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I try to reframe why questions into how or what. Um, A good point for me. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I my my uh, psychology doing has has taught me about that. You ask somebody, well, why why do you do that? Oh, it's impossible to answer. Anyway, um, but one of the reasons I know I continue with art making, uh, kind of piled onto those earlier reasons of agency, is that art making, and if you go into pottery. <laughs> This will be a challenge. Um, it does, it is able to give you a sense of control in a positive way. Uh, an inner sense that I can control my, um, my environment mm -hmm. uh, or at least some, some places in my environment, some aspects of my environment. And that sense of control brings a sense of order, maybe peace, mm -hmm. uh, and um, 
And that also then leads to this growing sense of agency. I think it's a good place to go when we talk about perfectionism and control. Like perfectionism, you're trying to control what you can, right? And to make it as perfect as possible. But clay, pottery, I can imagine that being an incredibly an incredible challenge for perfectionists. And tell me about that and what that's taught you about yourself. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, I I really always get into the minutia of of things and really try to make everything exact and fit, whether I'm developing a training or a curriculum or teaching in front of the classroom or or writing or doing a research project. So um, I I've been known to be a bit of a perfectionist, and people have um, have uh, called me that. I have been challenged by the clay on the wheel that can, as the first thing you have to do after you wedge the clay and make sure that it doesn't have any air in it is to center it on the wheel. If you don't center that clay, you're not gonna be able to do very much with it. So you have to center it so that it stops wobbling and it is perfectly still going around in a fast, uh, world that that is perfectly centered and perfectly still. That in itself is just internally calming and in order when you feel that clay stop wobbling and get centered. Wow, that the first time that happened that, that I accomplished it, it was amazing. <laughs> and that's because of the internal uh, kinesthetic uh, senses that we get from art making that transfer to an internal state of, of calm and order and balance. Um, so, uh, so you have to center it. Then you have to try to make something of it. And uh, I have to tell you, um, the first pieces and even now sometimes pieces collapse. And so I had a day not to not too much in the past, that was total, you, you can consider it total disaster. Um, I, I couldn't get my pieces centered properly. When I did, there were air bubbles that threw it off center. When I got, when I pulled the clay up and was thinking I was making a cylinder or vase or whatever I was making, uh, I, I pulled either too quickly or too much. And so the rim collapsed and, um, I had to start over and uh, then I went to another piece that I'd made and I tried to put a handle on it and the handle was falling off. So you would think that I would have left um, that day feeling really frustrated and despondent. And I would have thought I would have too because it was a frustrating day. Um, and, and I didn't get anything done that I wanted to. And it really, I would have thought, would have bothered my, my tendency toward perfection. It did the opposite. And I couldn't understand why I got in the car and I was smiling, driving back home from the studio. Um, and my attitude was, boy, I really learned so much about letting go. Mm -hmm. uh, those of us who, who are in class always say the clay will let you know what it wants to be. And sometimes it's not what you're trying to do. <laughs> and that is so much like life. And so I learned so many life lessons from, from much art, but certainly uh, in this case from pottery that uh, I, I've learned so much about letting go, feeling the control, understanding that I can eventually bring some order, uh, but it's okay not to. Uh, and, and to let go of that perfectionistic uh, attitude. And it's really helped um, my state of mind. And, and um, I, I was surprised that I learned it uh, that quickly. Uh, and, and so it was really almost uh, a subconscious thing. Um, mm. uh, and, and so it, it's very much like life that uh, when we continue to strive for perfection, we miss 
the blessings that come from the process mm. of, of doing what we're doing. Um, and, and I think uh, I can think of times where that's been true. And so I really do try to let go in many phases of my life. Things don't have to be done my way. Somebody else's way is just as good. Uh, I don't have to fret about this or that. And so I'm really learning. Unfortunately, it took me 70 years to learn that. But, <laughs> uh, but I, I don't have to deal with the anxiety uh, and the nervousness and the frustration that comes with always pursuing perfection. So now I just pursue process mm -hmm. and understand that something that I wanted to be this might be okay turning out to be that. There's some blessings in, in that. I'll, uh, hold on, I'll show you. An example? Yeah. <laughs> It has my pottery tools in it, so I'll take it, take them out. But um, this this is not a bad looking little vase. It's not the most perfect, but it's not bad looking. It has a little character. It has a lot of character. It's beautiful. Yeah, this was one of the disasters uh, <laughs> that was supposed to be something else entirely. Uh, it collapsed, thus the uh, uneven. And I was going to throw it away, and my teacher said, "No, glaze it." And this is one of the first pieces I glazed. So I didn't understand how glaze could really save mm. and change the whole feeling of your piece. And as soon as it came out of the kiln and, you, and when you put on glaze, you often don't know what it looks like because the, the glaze can go on orange and it comes out a different color. So I had no idea what it was gonna look like. And it came out and as soon as it came out of the kiln, I said, wow, mm. that's a surprise. I really like it. So our mistakes and our, and our imperfections uh, can really sometimes uh, come out to be beautiful. And that's such a strong lesson for, for me um, that, that I've really embraced that and tried to accept the gifts of the process as they come. And that's one of the blessings of living an art rich life. Uh, that that the art teaches us so much about how to live. One question I have, though, as you're talking about doing your clay making and how it felt like just getting once you finally got it centered. Mm -hmm. And I think of that um, on a spiritual level. And this conversation has been very nourishing to me by the way, just like the brief conversation we've had so far. Um, but on a spiritual level of like becoming centered. And I think that a lot of times when we think of spirituality and as I mature um, spiritually, and it's not that I'm necessarily outside of the context of any like formal religion, but that too. But um, I think that my understanding of spirituality is different. And so I think the arts is deeply embedded in my spirituality. And I wonder uh, if you're okay with like just sharing a little bit more of like how the arts has helped you spiritually in your growth. Um, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a heavy uh, question probably. But. but great, great question because it, it, it has. And actually, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the artist, the, the piano player, that um, that has said that his piano playing is a spiritual practice. Um, oh, he was on uh, the Late Show. He was the band leader on the on the Late Show. He's he's a wonderful um, a John Batiste. Oh, I love his music. I mean, yes. ama amazing artist. Yeah, amazing artist. So uh, he always says that his uh, playing art making is a spiritual practice. And I feel the very same way, uh, both in music uh, that, that has always touched me deeply and, and music of course, and, and visual art and, and dance. Um, most art making has the ability to move right past all of our defenses 
and touch the emotional centers of our brains and our, 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 our bodies. Um, and, and it has that ability to then blend our emotions with our cognitions, with our, with our thoughts. And that combination can be a powerful combination for growing our spiritual practice. So for me, art making is a spiritual practice. Um, um, I guess meaning um, that you do it intentionally, uh, that you do it with um, mindfulness, with consistency, and that it helps you transcend the immediate chaos. Yeah. It moves uh, us, mind, body, and spirit. It can move us to uh, a transcendent uh, status. And so for me, that's exactly what happens in the sacred space. Because I think spiritual practice happens in a sacred space, whether it's a chair or uh, my garage, which I have been intentionally turning into my pottery studio um, and that sacred space. Um, so uh, really sacred in terms of um, being set aside um, where certain, only certain things take place. Um, certain rituals happen, whether it's my putting on my apron, getting my bucket of water, making sure my sponge is on the wheel, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there are some special rules and things that go on in sacred spaces. So uh, it has helped me value that whole idea of a sacred space. Um, uh, and, and spiritual practice. And then in more tangible ways, uh, it has enhanced my relationship with the divine uh, and helping me get to know the divine presence more. So I, I really do believe that there is a creator God. And when we create, we step into the character of God. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, and you know that. And so um, as we create, if we're attentive to the process and what's going on inside of us, uh, we can learn about uh, the character of ourselves and uh, the character of God um, in, in doing that. Um, I often... Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you this little story. I'll try to make it short. I was absolutely stunned when I walked into our craft fair here where I live in my community. We have tons of artists and people who make all kinds of stuff. Um, but all kinds of other clubs uh, can also have a little table and say, hey, come join our club. Well, there's a, a, a spiritual club. I think they do Bible study and they might be called the Bible study club. I was stunned when I walked in and saw their table and they had this big picture of Jesus. It's the picture of Jesus that looks like a white man with blonde hair and blue eyes that I had up on my wall when I was a little elementary school kid because those were the only pictures of Jesus around. So a lot of kids I know had that, that picture. This day and age, I was stunned that they were still using that model that isn't even biblically accurate for Jesus, this Palestinian Jew who uh, was not blonde haired and blue eyed. Um, and, and so that made me start to think about uh, how have I expanded my concept and image of God who is, and we are all made in her image, uh, how have I expanded? And I, in thinking about that, I have understood how art has helped me expand my, my ideas and image of the creator. And one of my drawings is of the divine as something that might look to you, I don't, I don't have it here, like a huge cloud uh, with this, big um, 
pearly mane of, of hair, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. But with female characteristics and no real color that you could make out. Uh, you do that by mixing. And I, I did that. Uh, I think I did that one day after I was, during, during my journey of kind of a 40 day fast uh, during Lent, I think, when we were thinking through um, uh, our relationship. And so I was just drawing something of the divine that I could relate to. And art gives us all the ability to um, envision and see the divine as in a way that we can really relate to. And I think that's important um, that we image that. My, my um, PhD thesis was about uh, the values of psychotherapists and, um, and, and the values of religion and how that impacts their therapy. And one of the things that came out of that was because so many the convention was to see God and Jesus as male and father that has thrown so many young people, uh, cause that's who I was dealing with, uh, away from faith and away from spirituality, away from religion because their sense of father was horrible. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so casting in a particular image from a particular culture and a has I think been a real disservice um, to, to the growth of spirituality and, and real deep faith. Anyway, that, that said, it is really, art has really helped me expand my vision and image of the creator and the divine. Uh, and sometimes the lyrics of a spiritual song, uh, I will just get up and dance around the room like I'm crazy uh, as an expression of joy that helps me connect uh, with, with that spirit. Um, if I play music or draw as I'm listening to a meditative or spiritual uh, reading or scripture, it deepens my understanding because I'm bringing to bear my entire brain. Because um, art is not just a right brain activity. It's, it's a whole brain activity art making is. And so it brings to bear my whole being uh, as I'm contemplating my spirituality. So, and my relationship with the divine. So it deepens understanding of what you're reading. It deepens understanding of what you're feeling. It allows you to express that. It, it expands your conception and image of what is spiritual uh, and what is divine. Um, helps you create sacred space, transcend the mundane and the chaos. I asked you a question around identity. And uh, when I first, when I sent you a message last night, I talked about being an African-American woman, but as I thought about it more, I want to kind of broaden that of like identity, yes, as an African-American woman, but um, the wholeness of your know, like holistic identity beyond, you know, just the color of your skin, which does influence, of course, uh, being that we're in this country and the, the history, but what has or how has your identity influenced your creative process or has it at all? Uh, so during the pandemic, I was in a class. Uh, I, I got myself into a visual art class. Never done visual arts. I'm not an a visual artist, um, but it didn't matter because I thought it was just important uh, a, as a statement of, I am not helpless. I can control some of my environment. So there's art helping with control and um, a, a, and hopefulness and, and, and being active. I got myself into an uh, art class from a nonprofit that I knew about way back, but they advertised that they were doing something online. So I took this visual art class in, um, in line. Line drawing was the first thing, uh, kind of journaling through, through art. And so one of the se early sessions, we were working with drawing lines as well as uh, pairing that with breathing. Um, 
so this organization was both art and and spiritual they they had a spiritual base for it which i liked and so as i was drawing the lines and uh breathing deeply this was just around the time when george floyd was murdered and it immediately occurred to me and i really do think that this is because of my own consciousness of of being african american and what is happening to african american people because everyone else in the class was caucasian and they were struck that i would even have that relationship, that, that that relationship would occur. It immediately struck me in the middle of the drawing that I was breathing and I could breathe when George Floyd said, I can't breathe. And it occurred to me that my purpose, part of my purpose in life, because art can reveal purpose. That's one of the other wonderful things that it does, yeah. I should be breathing for other African-American people who can't. Mm. And then I had to think about, I think I have, uh, this, is, this is the, I'll put it this way. I don't know if you can read it or if it's backwards. Oh, no, this is right. Yeah. Uh, choose joy, choose life, breathe life. Can you send me a picture of that too? If, when you're yeah, sure. Yeah, I have a picture of it. Yeah. Okay. I can breathe for you when you can't. Be still and know I am God. Choose joy and choose life. Those were the other thoughts that were coming to me. Uh, but, but after that, I had to really think about, okay, how can I understand this as a divine revelation about purpose and how I can practically breathe for other people when they can't. What does that mean? So, so then that set off a whole chain of other uh, kinds of activities and actions um, that I wanted to engage in to be able to do that. But it totally came from art and it totally came from art inspired by who I was. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that is- uh, that, that answers that really well in a, in a very practical way. Um when it comes to the arts. And yeah. I think that that thought process is really important. Because when I think about breath, and I just finished a piece on breath, literally. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, now, my art practice was a little bit different. It was, I don't think I shared it with you. I was I'm been incorporating my athletic background into my art process. Oh. So it was, I hit a heavy bag, and I, but I put a canvas on the heavy bag, and I had paint on my gloves, and I had, Ooh. yeah. So it was, a, it was based on. There's an artist. His name is um, Shinohara, Oshia Shinohara. He's from Japan. There's a documentary about he and his wife called uh, "Cutie and the Boxer," mm -hmm. and I first came across him at the Met, and he uh, there was a video of him punching a canvas. And I thought, well, I want to do that. And this was like probably back in grad school many years ago. And uh, and it just finally, in a, in a moment of, I need to do something outside of what I've been doing so that I can have control. And Ooh. I didn't realize it, that that was what I was doing in that moment. But everything seems a little bit out of control. I need some level of control. I'm going to take my time and do this and put my energy into it. And it was all around breath. So... Yeah. Yeah. And the, like the importance of breath, because like when you're hitting it, when you're punching a heavy bag or throwing a punch, like you're always supposed to breathe out. Like that's supposed to be your practice every single time you throw a punch, because mm -hmm. that's where your power is coming from, your force. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, oxygen ends up, goes into the blood. The blood biblically is our life force. Mm -hmm. We're mm -hmm. breathing, we're pumping out that life force. And when you think about someone that can't breathe, how do I live for them? How do I do this for them? That's a very communal take on uh on on living and i think it's really important uh when we think about our breath that our breath is yes it's ours but as we're breathing we're taking in we're breathing out how are we engaging how are we living for ourselves and others and um being really conscious of that so i, I really appreciate your thought process as you're doing your work i think it's really important and somebody last night asked me what do you do in the evenings and i'm like that's when i spend my time really reflecting and thinking 
Yeah. I didn't realize that I was like, that was a practice, a ritual of mine at the end of my day. I spent hours like just kind of thinking I might be reading. I might take a break. I might, I smoke a, a pipe, I, but it's not it's just tobacco. I've been doing that for a long time. So like, I'll do that. And I'm thinking and I'm processing. And that breath is like, I don't know. All of it is very intertwined as you're talking. I'm like, this makes a lot of sense when it comes to my identity in in the work that I'm doing and how my reflection, I feel like art is probably somewhere upwards to like 80% thought. And then it's just like the doing. <laughs> At least from my experience, it's a lot of, a lot of thought goes into it. Thought, thought is a, a lot of it. Um, and, and it's when our, our cognitions, our thoughts get married with that emotion that, that um, we can really make good art. And according to Susan Langer, good art is that art which uh, successfully conveys your feelings about mm. the world. Yeah. Yeah. You. yeah. I love that. You mentioned the pandemic, and I know that you came out with a book. It's called Faith, Food, and Art, Surviving the Pandemic of 2020. And as we're talking about spending time thinking, like, what what was that experience for you? We talked about spirituality. We talked about art. We didn't talk about food yet, so I'm curious about that. And what was it like for you surviving the pandemic? And before you answer that, when did you move from Philadelphia? Was that before the pandemic? Yes. I moved from Philadelphia in 2007, November, 2017. Okay. Okay. Got it. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that. Very good. Well, yeah. yeah, Curious about your thoughts about the pandemic and then uh, what made you come out with your book and, and what was that like for you? Yeah. Uh, The pandemic was of course isolating for uh, most people. And, and I understood that uh, well, the first thing I said to myself is, I will not let this pandemic kill me. I will mm-hmm. not die because of this. Mm-hmm. And so then, okay, w- w- what are you going to do? And so that's when all of this um, acting around how am I going to take care of myself uh, and, and self-care, you know, is a lot of, lot of things. It's what you eat how do you take care of your physical self, your, your spiritual self, uh, uh, and, um, so, and how do I keep up my, my fitness program, and, and so lots of things, uh, we strategized about, and, and we were helped by where I live, I have a wonderful community, and a wonderful fitness program, all, all of our fitness instructors, they all stayed in their houses, recorded themselves uh, oh. and, and every day they were on a Facebook page live so that we could tune in uh, whenever we wanted and continue our exercise programs. I made a mental note of the fact that you look very fit. So oh. <laughs> I don't know if that you've been working out, I guess, as you're talking about that, like you look like you've been working out. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't have the muscle but I have the tone and um, I, I try to stay pretty heart healthy. So I'm doing something uh, at least five days a week. Um, so, and, and all of that really got reinforced out of the pandemic uh, as part of, of a whole self-care plan. Uh, so it, it emerged rather organically, uh, the book did and, and, and the, what went in the book, uh, it just started as my need to communicate and connect to my friends what I was doing. Mm-hmm. Here, here's what I'm doing. Here's how I'm occupying my time. Uh, I believe that, uh, and I really do, that there was there is some divine purpose in allowing this to happen. I took for myself, part of that is that everything stopped. Okay. Uh, are, are we listening to maybe a divine message about stop it? You're just going berserk here, world. Mm-hmm. And so I took that as an opportunity to Sabbath. And so I do practice Sabbathing. Mm-hmm. That is resting long enough 
to recuperate and rejuvenate. My, there's a grass, grassy, there's a patch outside in my backyard that because the wheels of the lawnmower continually turn on that one patch when it turns around, there's a big dirt hole. Mm -hmm. During the winter, we had five months of that lawnmower not coming. Mm -hmm. And so what I just observed a month ago is that grass is growing right. in that spot because it rested from the stress long enough to rejuvenate and follow its natural path for growth. Mm -hmm. Our bodies do the same thing and our minds do the same thing. We, we pursue health, we, we really do in natural ways. So um, I just started knowing that I needed to connect to somebody somehow, and I needed to be active because I knew what art making at that point, I taught it long enough, could do. So I knew I needed to be creating uh, and I needed to be eating well. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, somebody gave me as a gift this, um, oh, I forget what the cookbook is called. I don't know why I can't call it now, but uh, it's a cookbook that, that gives you recipes from the research that was done all around the world, looking at the communities where people live the longest. Oh, okay. And, and so they looked at how they were eating, put out these recipes. California, by the way, is one of the places that they <laughs> that's why. <laughs> put, and then all the other places were outside of the US. Uh, anyway, um, I just started trying to eat well and figuring out what that looked like and making all of these new things. And I got into baking. I've always liked baking, hadn't done it, done it in a long while, but it too is creative. And I just wasn't baking any old thing. I was baking things that were pieces of artwork. <laughs> <laughs> and I just started taking pictures because somebody said, oh, send me a picture. Well, then I started taking pictures of everything I did, mm -hmm. what I cooked, uh, what I drew, um, uh, maybe a little music uh, thing that I had, had uh, developed, a little melody. I took pictures of everything. Mm -hmm. And I just said, oh, I think I'll collect these and put them together. And then the idea of, of, of a little tiny book, that was my journal of how I survived the pandemics, plural, mm -hmm. uh, political unrest, the George Floyd murders. So racial injustice, political unrest and, um, and the COVID. Right. Uh, it, it just emerged into a collection of what I was doing to save, save my, my sanity, my health, preserve my life. So when I met you, um... I I remember going to a friend of mine invited me to uh, a workshop at Eastern and I was not a student at the time, of course, and Build a Bridge was doing this workshop. And I remember at first I was like, this is so weird because <laughs> we were walking around as people were saying mangle, mangle. And I think you were tapping on something and it was like a percussion instrument. Yeah. And I, once I finally like, at the workshop rested in it and allowed myself to just enjoy it I really enjoyed it and then of course becoming a part of the program at Eastern studying urban studies studying um community arts it definitely shaped my life in a way that brought me to where I'm at now you know yeah. and I think about that a lot uh and you know we've talked a lot about being uh directors of nonprofits, starting nonprofits. And so I would like you to just share a little bit about your experience with Build a Bridge, uh, starting Build a Bridge. And um, yeah, I think that I'll leave it kind of open-ended of whatever you would like to share about that. Yeah. Well, uh, Nathan Corbett, of course, had a lot to, to, to do with that. I had come to Eastern as the graduate dean and he was there as the chair of communications. And he's... Uh, uh, the Angels of Harmony, which is this multi-ethnic gospel choir, uh, needed some help. And so I, I liked choral conducting. And so 
I got involved in doing that. He was directing the Eastern Winds and he simply came to, to my office one day as one of the graduate faculty um, in, in, and said, what do you think about taking the angels and the Eastern Winds to South Africa? Because mm -hmm. apartheid was crumbling. Okay. And in celebration of that, and the, and the and the the gospel choir of Eastern University had every color of uh, every ethnic group uh, in it, international, national. It was a wonderful group of people who visually, and of course musically, demonstrates how people live, sing in harmony from mm -hmm. very different backgrounds, and so. We ended up, not the Eastern Winds, but we ended up taking the angels on this unbelievable uh, trip for which we fundraised like crazy. Uh, we had maybe 60 people joining the choir just because they heard we were going to Africa. And I think we ended up taking maybe 30 or 35 mm -hmm. in celebration of all the racial barriers that were falling. Um, so we sang for the, the Black Baptist Seminary, which could finally reopen, and we sang for that reopening, and schools, and it, just all sorts of things. It was such a joyous, um, joyous trip. So we did that. Then um, one of uh, Dr. Nathan's uh, students, graduates, had gone to Costa Rica and called him back and said, you know, this earthquake just happened and the government is not gonna fix the port and the roads because, and it's mostly um, darker skinned people who live in this community that's now disrupted and depressed and, and people are out of work and whatnot. Can you bring a team of musicians and, and later years artists that look like us? to help us energize our community. Mm -hmm. And so he asked me to go and we got a student, um, a diverse uh, small group of, of student artists that we knew both at Eastern and, and outside. And we went to Costa Rica to help them seed a music institute that would be theirs and to do some other things. Um, that was the beginning thought of, and, and, and we eventually saw in two years what a music institute could do for um, a community that has suffered trauma and disaster. Um, and, and there's so many stories out of that with the kids and everything else, but we saw what it could do economically because um, it really spearheaded into action people who um, started collectives and, and a community built a community schoolroom and just took on their community because the government wasn't. Mm. So from that, we had the idea, gee whiz, look what the arts can do mm -hmm. uh, in community. And we also noticed that the artists, that we took were great artists, but they didn't have the training in how to teach right. and necessarily how to work with other people mm -hmm. and the kids. So, um, so that was one leg of the start of Build a Bridge, the, the, the mission. And the other was while Nathan was really working on the international scene mostly, and that's why we had the Africa con. Uh, connections. I was working domestically through my church and I had started this summer arts camp because I noticed that kids weren't learning. They weren't learning what I was teaching them in Sunday school. They weren't learning what their teachers two or three years ago in Sunday school, uh, they didn't remember. And so, you know, you build on it. And by the time they got to me, I had the senior high kids, uh, students. Um, they didn't know anything. I said, what's going on with their learning? And I decided it wasn't them. It's the way they're being taught. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, memorization and being read to and all this boring stuff. So I started a summer camp. We're doing we're doing everything through art making, mm. dance, uh, visual arts, um, music, all, all 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 of them. Um, and then I measured their learning over a couple of years. It improved. So I was doing that kind of thing uh, around teaching and learning and Nathan around community and economic development. And so those two things came together, what I was trying to do and what we were doing, what he was doing in Costa Rica and Africa. And we said, let's, let's start an organization that gets artists to give their gifts in service of community and other people, not just the, the hallowed halls of performance. Uh, and let's teach them how to take that gift and really use it to serve. That's, that was the idea of Build-A-Bridge.